Inferno number four is the long-anticipated conclusion to Jonathan Hickman's time as the head of X and the saga that started in 2019's Sublime House of X and Powers of Ten. It's been the most enjoyable X-Men era since I've cared about comic books, and the first time in my life I've had good reason to read every X-Men comic week to week. That said, with Hickman's announced departure from the office, there's a bittersweet undertone to Inferno, an event that answers some of the biggest mysteries from House and Powers, but is still very much a midway point for the Krakoa era, even as some things change forever and some remain the same, perhaps forever as well. Today I'll answer, does Hickman's Inferno effectively end the Hickman era of X-Men? What was Moira planning and what do I make of the reveal? What's next for X-Men and the destiny of X here in 2022? Hey everybody, I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. You are listening to an Inferno number 4 review, Crack and Krakoa number 207. If you like the Comic Book Herald YouTube channel, please consider liking, subscribing, sharing, and commenting. It all helps me out a great deal. You can catch the live stream discussion, including one we already did on Inferno number 4, on Casual Krakoa's airing pretty much every Wednesday I'm available, circa 5.15 Central Standard Times. If you missed the live stream I did with Blurred Without Fear and Verno of the Cerebros, you can find that here on the channel, and I'll link it in the show notes as well. Spoilers for Discuss Comics. Follow. Writer Jonathan Hickman, artist Valerio Shidi and Stefano Caselli, colors by David Curiel, letters by Joe Sabino. The issue begins where Inferno number 3 left off, with Magneto and Professor X facing down an army of Orcus agents, Omega Sentinel and Nimrod. Magneto and Professor X are on the hunt for Moira, but have fallen straight into a trap laid by Mystique and Destiny, who got to Moira first. Before the battle even begins, Omega Sentinel and Nimrod make a huge declaration, wiping all of their human allies out, telling them, You... It's as if you are not even here, and this is how little you matter. That's Omega Sentinel's secret, which we've seen developed so beautifully in Inferno number 3, telling Professor and Magneto, we hate them as much as we hate you. It's a hell of an opening salvo, a cold, callous proclamation that Hickman's X-Men has always been about the growing threat of artificial intelligence. From the House of X plot to stop Nimrod from coming online, to the Powers of Ten Futures where Nimrod's and Homo Novissima reign supreme. And while, yes, the secret rise of machines is all very Isaac Asimov's iRobot, and well-explored territory in the annals of science fiction, it's a welcome confirmation here in X-Men comics. Man vs. Mutant is regularly very tired, and in an era where real threats and philosophical debates about AI are poised to only accelerate, Mutant vs. Machine is simply far more interesting. I love, too, Hickman's callbacks to his own work in House and Powers here, with Omega Sentinel inverting Moira's line to Professor X, it's not a dream if it's real, with the following, This is your nightmare, no? Listen to me, mutant. It's not a nightmare if it's real. I really love the artistic display of Nimrod here, a growing, surging menace, equal parts Shadow King and Ultron, in the all-out action of Magneto and Professor X unleashed against the power of the Omega Sentinel and Nimrod, particularly with Professor X throwing down a cybolt that nearly tears Nimrod apart for a time. I'll admit, this one took me a minute <laughs> because I was thinking, what is Professor X going to do against an Omega Sentinel and a Nimrod? Turns out, throw some fierce Cyblast, which is a thing we've seen him do in the past. The fight between the power players comes to a head when Nimrod destroys the Cerebral Helmet and then grabs Professor X's noggin like it's a watermelon. Magneto has Omega Sentinel on the ropes, but gives way because Nimrod tells him he'll let him and Professor X walk away and go find Moira, and Professor X convinces Magneto that right now this is the most important thing. They have to find Moira. Unsurprisingly, Nimrod lies and kills Professor X, although he is so sorry about it, and Magneto is defeated after Omega Sentinel hits him with a power dampener. Before Magneto dies, Omega Sentinel makes a crucial point. You have to understand, to us, there's no difference between humans and mutants. To us, you are the same. And finally, Omega repeats a Cyclops line from House of X number one about the way machines have been used and deleted and discarded. Did you honestly think we were going to sit around forever and just take it? You know, having recently seen The Mitchells vs. The Machines on Netflix, a great animated film from the studio that brought us into the Spider-Verse, this one definitely struck a chord. If you've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, highly recommend it. Really fun animated movie. I do want to take a moment here to say the evolution of Orcus as the primary threat to Kakroa, from poorly defined humans like Director Devo, to poorly defined humans unknowingly controlled by very well defined machines, Omega Sentinel and Nimrod, is a huge positive for the X line moving forward. I really like this. The dramatic irony present for the Orcus protocols is now especially interesting for the likes of someone like Abigail Brandt, given what we just saw in Sword Number 11 and her revealed connections to the agency. 
Page 12 of Inferno number 4 is absolutely brilliant, with Mystique and Destiny telling a captured Moira they knew her whole deal, and Mystique shooting her, despite the fact that Moira's death will reset the universe. We then get two pages of Fade to White before a huge Death of Moira X teaser. This really shocked me. I did not expect a universe reset at this point. You know, when I was reading the comic, I was thinking that maybe Destiny and Mystique knew that they could get away with it because, you know, in Destiny's Life 11, she would also be reborn with the knowledge to prepare for Moira X in a new life. And, I mean, possibly they could have a plan there, but uh, no. Instead, we get the explanation for what Mystique and Destiny have been up to, basically a how they did it, including Emma gifting them Forge's mutant cure gun that she, uh, he invented back in Uncanny X-Men number 185, which was accidentally used on Storm at the time to remove her powers for several years in publication, and of course Mystique shapeshifting her way through Orcus's capture of Myra, setting the stage for Destiny and Mystique's power position in the now. It's all a bit too reliant on Hickman's overuse of the magician revealing his tricks, but it does lead to a very cool quote from Mystique, a character who has more than had this moment of power coming throughout this era of X-Men. I am everywhere. I am nowhere. A shadow unchained and unleashed. The world made me this way, so let the world suffer, whoever its masters may be. The big reveal, as Mystique and Destiny interrogate Moira and use Forge's gun to depower her, and is that they, you know, they plan to kill the ironically now human Moira. Before this, though, Moira tells them that what they think is a perfect reality for mutants, the Krakoa era, is something she herself doesn't believe in at all. As she puts it, it's the same thing every time. The humans win, or the machines win, and we always lose to one or both of them. And here's the real moment. The real reveal of Moira's plan is that in order to save mutant kind, Moira wants to cure mutant kind. Moira would use her mutant cure to prevent anyone from ever being born a mutant so they wouldn't know what they lost. Moira's whole plan is curing mutant kind. Mutants can't win, so Moira turns them all human and creates a possible path for success, for survival. If you can't beat them, join them. It's assimilation into human society while completely losing what made mutant kind unique. It's dangerous on a number of levels, especially in the messaging. It's quite sad, honestly. It also makes sense. This is the path Moira believed in the most, and the one she never got to fully try because Mystique and Destiny burned her alive before she could see what would happen, before she could see how it would play out. Is it the most satisfying answer? Not really, but it makes sense. For me, the revelations of Inferno number 3 and the Omega Sentinel are far more satisfying and far less likely to see coming. Nonetheless, this is clearly what Inferno number 1 was building towards, and there's narrative consistency in that. I'll admit, I kind of always wanted <laughs> Moira's reveal to be something massive, right? To be related to the science fiction of Powers and Ten and Phalanx and Dominions and all that cool stuff. And it's simple, honestly. It's simple, especially for a character that we always knew was human. Throughout X-Men history, that was all she wanted for everyone. You know, the same thing every time. The humans win or the machines win, and we always lose to one or both of them. So what do you do? What do you do? You cure mutant kind. You get rid of the problem. You become either human or machine so that you also can potentially win. This is the only way that Moira sees forward. And again, it's a very defeatist yet lived experience attitude. With this reveal, there are questions. For example, if this was Moira's plan, were Professor X and Magneto on board? And if she tricked them into thinking the secret plan was something else, which seems somewhat likely given their interest in mutant kind, especially Magneto's, what was it they believed they were building towards instead? For my money too, the biggest miscalculation of the Hickman X-Men experience is the misuse of Moira Axe. Moira was a prop instead of a proper character, which is really a travesty given she's one of the top three most exciting things about all of House and Powers, the engine that made the whole experience so exciting. And we jump straight from the start of her story to an ending of sorts without any real moments in between. There's definitely a big part of me that wishes the contents of Inferno were more or less what the Hickman X-Men run focused on, building instead to an event that was based on this information. Before Mystique can murderize Moira, our good boy waiting in the wings makes a dramatic appearance, and my god, that's Doug Ramsey's music. Doug tells Mystique she can't murder Moira because now that Moira's human, it would violate Krakoan law. Murder no man, of course, coming into effect. This argument clearly means nothing to Mystique, but fortunately for Doug, he's backed up by Krakoa, Bay the Blood Moon, and Warlock, putting the odds not in Mystique and Destiny's favor, who did not see this one coming. Destiny's blinded here to this moment, she says, the boy bringing chaos and a breaking of time. 
There's some really interesting moments as Destiny references the branching nexus points of realities, all stemming from the actions taken and the words spoken in these moments. Once Doug shows up, Destiny foretells three possible futures, and I'm curious, based on the fact that the Destiny of X teasers Marvel had three possible futures as well, will we see some of these outcomes moving forward? I really hope that we might. The first option. If they kill Moira, Destiny and Mystique are removed from the council. Mystique is exiled, and Destiny will die six months after that and not be reborn. Not stated here, but if they kill Moira, there's also way less likely to be an 11th life, and Moira's abilities are you know, reinstilled in her, although of course we still have a resurrection in play potentially. Option two, they attempt to kill Doug and his allies. If they do that, Mystique will die. Destiny would remain on the council, and it's possible Mystique would be resurrected in three years' time, quite a bit later. Option number three, let Moira escape, and the status quo is maintained with Mystique and Destiny on the council with our boy, Doug. So Destiny and Mystique select option three here, setting up a human Moira on the run, but still very much the target of her enemies. Also, Warlock calls Moira here self-not-friend, which is literally the sickest burn in history. I'm enjoying here too, Doug is the grand unifier, the power player who keeps Krakoa afloat. It's a really cool progression and evolution for Cypher, a character that, you know, writers have not had a heck of a lot of ideas for in the, uh, or I guess they have had ideas, but certainly not ones that made him look quite so cool. So just Destiny Mystique select option three here, setting up a human Moira on the run, but still very much the target of her enemies. Um, oh, and I'm reading the same thing. <laughs> I'm just going to leave it in because I don't like editing. After all that, Professor X and Magneto are resurrected to find that Emma Frost has made the entire Quiet Council aware of Moira's existence and role, setting the stage for a very ominous continued reign of the Quiet Council of Krakoa forever and ever. Amen. It's foreboding, but there's also a metatextual element to the ending in terms of how long X-Men comics might be stuck in the Krakoa era versus moving forward with Hickman's original vision for an Act 2 of mutant kind that would have changed the game more radically, or so we've been led to believe. I think this is likely fans reading into the text more than any deliberate shade being cast, but I can see where it comes from. Again, I don't think it's super intentional, but you know, are we locked in the cycle of Krakoa stories forever? Surely not, but it kinda kinda can feel that way. So. If you're keeping score at home, Inferno delivers on the following House and Powers mysteries. The secret true plan of Moira X, delivered. What Doug, Krakoa, and Warlock have been up to, at least up to a point, delivered. And the mission of Orcus and their leadership, in easily the coolest reveal of the bunch in Inferno number 3, is revealed where it's, it's you know, revealed that Omega Sentinel has been sent back in time and has now uh, built and, and is heading up Orcus. It also leaves behind, you know, tw 10 to 20 unsolved mysteries <laughs> that I'm compiling for a future video because there are so many seeded plot points here that simply have not been touched. And that is either exciting because they might be in the future or a huge bummer <laughs> because they're not going to be developed by the, you know, the architect who put them there in the first place. I've seen it said repeatedly that Inferno feels rushed, which, again, considering it's like 200 pages of comics, is saying something. And I actually don't know that the story itself is overtly rushed. There are certainly elements that are, but so much as the context, where we know this is Hickman's final story in this era, and that we weren't really ready for a conclusion like that. And the books aren't ready for any kind of conclusion there either, you know? Inferno isn't an endpoint. It's an alteration to the current state of Krakoa. It's an event that sort of just adjusts things. It moves things a bit to the left <laughs> in terms of what's coming for this era of X-Men. Given the time constraints, I think Inferno pretty effectively puts an end cap on some of the biggest Hickman era mysteries from House and Powers. The problem here is the time constraints are mostly of their own making. When you combine Hickman's exit from the team with the way the story is delivered, there's definitely something missing to make it truly special, as I think it's good, but no more. It's not special. It's not what House and Powers were. Inferno is ultimately Hickman closing the door on his X-Men run, at least as it fits into the Krakoan era, and he's deliberately passing the torch to Kieran Gillen's immortal X-Men, who will take on the Mutant Quiet Council in earnest from here in the Destiny of X. So where does the Destiny of X go from here? Well, the X office will continue to explore the Krakoa era with the mutant nation still in tremendous position globally and throughout space with Planet Arako, but with a messy drama-filled internal quiet council. There are new titles that offer promise, like Immortal X-Men, Al Ewing on X-Men Red, and Victor Laval on Sabretooth and Beyond, and plenty of titles that bring some of the baggage and skepticism from their initial runs in the Dawn of X and Reign of X. It's undoubtedly a good time to be an X-Men comics fan, with the most consistent quality books, with the most intentional integration I've seen in my lifetime. But the feverish excitement of the House and Powers days is a lifetime ago, an almost impossible pre-pandemic world when it seemed like anything could happen for Marvel's mutants and the journey could last forever. 
Well, anything didn't happen. This did, replete with high highs and, on rare occasions, very low lows. It's up to a new era and some new creators to see if ascension is possible once more. Thanks for listening, everybody. I'm Dave Busing, founder and editor-in-chief of comicbookherald.com. You can find ways to support the site and the channel over at patreon.com slash comicbookherald. You can find all my stuff at Comic Book Herald on Twitter and Instagram, as well as comicbookherald.com for the website. Look for the best comics ever in my Marvelous Year podcast for everything I'm doing on the podcast side of things. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and as always, enjoy the comics.